Hey everybody, you just finished listening to Lord Huron Ancient Names Part 1. Uh, sorry for the sudden stop there, it seems like something's a little buggy with the station, but hopefully you're hearing me okay out there. This is 88.1 FM, the voice of your college. Thanks for tuning in this afternoon at 3 to WVYC. I'm your host, Keelan Tollinger. Uh, until 4 o'clock p.m. this afternoon. So this is the February 15th, 2019 edition of In the Studio. And uh, don't forget that if you happen to miss last week's show, which was a great one in my opinion, um, you can, in your free time, go online to YouTube.com and search In the Studio with Keel and Tollinger. So you can find the channel where I upload all of my archive shows. Uh, I would have totally suggest that if you haven't heard about the uh, diversity issue on uh, your college's uh, advertisement at the Rev Stadium, and also about that race revolt lecture held in the WPAC last Wednesday. Uh, a pair of really debate-heavy uh, local stories. But this week, maybe you were impacted by the weather around Monday and Tuesday. Uh, where we, we dealt with that persistent front that came along and put precipitation down on the ground for a full day. Uh, first, some snow in the early morning hours on Monday, which, while it got messy a little bit, the college must have been thinking, eh, let's wait, let's wait. A um, couple more hours, get some class in, and then once two inches of snow had fallen or something, the roads were getting covered, and they finally gave up and said everyone can go home at four, no evening classes. Uh, for one thing, I had a Monday-Wednesday class that typically runs from 3 to 4.15, so I have a feeling the college officials didn't quite account for the schedules that might cut a course off 15 minutes early or so. On Tuesday morning, as a freezing rain began, the conditions were just uncertain enough that they issued an early morning two-hour delay. Not the cancellation I think we were all hoping for, but the whole event basically just gave evening class goers a break, uh, condensed my art studio class a little bit on Tuesday. But I think the dumbest thing, and what I've been keeping like an ear out for, for an explanation as to what the college was thinking, it had to be that snow removal notice they issued um, on Monday when the snow was still already falling. This was at 3 o'clock p.m. Now, typically on the eve of a big snowstorm, there's a notice about different parking procedures the day before so that when the college is closed or something the next day and getting buried, um, all the big lots are cleared off for the plows to run right across and free up space. But I don't think I've ever had, and, and this email said to, for like a main campus resident to take their car to a different part of main campus. What I had done since I'm a Tyler Run resident was move my car underneath the big parking garage uh, on Sunday night. The, the first flakes were already coming down. Um, I didn't want to have it covered just in case. So plenty of other residents do that too. Uh, the email said that no cars were permitted, um, basically, in the, in the garage or on top of it. I just needed to move mine to the, uh, the softball field over by the freshman dorms. Well, doing that on a Monday evening, preparing for my car to be encased in ice throughout Tuesday was sort of my slight worry. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I've got a roommate who needed to go to his class, well, from his class that day to his car and then to his workplace 20 minutes away. And if he still had to be digging out his car, uh, in the span of an hour, I mean, let's just say that Dr. GS, yeah, probably would have had a call from him and several other students, um, that it was kind of, uh, a chaotic scene. But, but once we left our cars there overnight into Tuesday, um, then they had to be back in the regular spots by Wednesday morning at 7. And this is completely complicated, but I mean, basically, I left my car across the creek so it could be covered another inch or two of snow um, and freezing rain. But um, instead, we didn't even get a cancellation for this apparent snow emergency. Now, the one positive that I could take away was that the rain got warm enough to melt plenty of the snow and ice on the roads and on my vehicle. But to not be able to wait things out under the garage where, like, they don't have to plow anyway... I don't understand it. I think West Campus students complain that there's no place for them to hide, and now this is the new procedure, perhaps. Um, but this is the one drawback, I guess, from being in the modern day. <laughs> like, if this were the 1990s or something, I mean, the college wouldn't have the power to, like, conduct traffic with the push of an email alert. It's just that these were the most, like, specific circumstances I think I've ever faced as a York College student. And I think it just had to do with how the storm was just inconvenient enough to warrant a late school closing, a, a campus snow emergency parking alert, and a delay. No, that's just the biggest issue with York College for this week. Uh, either way, we have a much more interesting things to talk about today, starting with the inception of a new major league sport. I'll tell you what the AAF stands for and what it might mean for one of America's most popular games. I previewed this next thing last week. This is the Facebook research app uh, revealed in a recent report, uh, which asked the question if you would give up your privacy on your mobile device for $20 a month. 
I'll also talk the death of a Mars rover and a unique program to train astronauts for a potential mission to the red planet someday and uh, check up with President Trump, the state of the second government shutdown that was pending, and something that's been missing from the White House, oddly enough, all this time. And then Valentine's Day was yesterday, and something really important was missing from that holiday, too. But we will get into that, the first round of news, after the first song for this hour. So I kind of, like, wish we were back in the 1990s, so oddly enough, that's where we're going for this whole edition. I've got a list of tracks that don't go past the year 2000. This is going to be kind of an odd show in that respect. But uh, starting off, I think I encountered this first song way back when I was a kid and MTV once played music videos. I mean, funny how that works out, but it's pretty much the equivalent of a one-hit wonder for this one pair. Uh, from October of 2000, this is by Evan and Jaren with a track titled Crazy For This Girl. I'll be back in three minutes to get the topic started here on WVYC. Welcome back to 88.1 FM WVYC, the voice of your college. That was Evan and Jaron with Crazy for This Girl. So I know that the Super Bowl finished up two weekends ago, and it seems like the national football conversation is about over, but it really isn't. It doesn't have to be. Uh, because now there is an alternative for the next few months available if you just can't live without football. Uh, that's the hole that the Alliance of American Football is trying to fill. Uh, it shows up in shorthand as the AAF, or it's being commonly called the Alliance as well. And so first of all, some basics about what it is. So it's the NFL cut down into a quarter as far as, like, far as the league sizes go. Um, there's only eight teams, mostly some smaller cities, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and run through some of them real quick. Well, I guess this one isn't quite a city, but one's called the Arizona Hotshots, the Orlando Apollos from Florida, the Birmingham Iron from Alabama, the Salt Lake City Stallions from Utah, the San Diego Fleet from California, the Memphis Express from Tennessee, the Atlanta Legends from Georgia, and lastly, the San Antonio Commanders from Texas. It's a bit of a complex list, but the uh, the team names sound all kind of strange, but that's a natural thing. Uh, it's the first time any of these groups played a game uh, Saturday and Sunday last week. So the Alliance's seasons are only 10 games in length, and they'll last for about another nine weekends. And then I think there's a four-team playoff, which I... I guess we'll have to have a final just name the, the championship or something uh, because they wouldn't want to call it the subpar ball or anything. But uh, I just kind of wonder what the, the trophy or the rings would look like if they even have any. But I think the premise of the AAF is that this is a developmental league first and foremost. So they take for starters recent young athletes who have played through college, uh, maybe have been drafted by one of the 32 NFL teams, but were considered just not good enough to be a permanent addition to the roster. Um, some players come out from college without a team to join at all and would like to be of that professional caliber someday. Um, and lastly, there's a small portion who have maybe outgrown the NFL, uh, getting a bit too old, but, but still with the drive to play, but maybe not at the same level. Uh, they can land a spot in the AAF as well. Essentially, it's a minor league NFL, like the, uh, the York Revolution is to the Phillies or the Hershey Bears to the Philadelphia Flyers. Now, I think the executives of the AAF, uh, whoever they are, I really have no idea who got this league together and funded it. They might be offended if they heard it called a minor counterpart to the NFL, but because I bet they really believe that if they can get a foothold in national television, uh, their league can serve as a training ground that players want to go to first and not see it as some sort of fallback or second chance of redemption. Uh, the most interesting thing about this league is the list of changes that they made to the NFL rulebook. Uh, well, well, first of all, the salary of every player is the same, so no majority goes to the quarterback like usual. Um, every player can receive a $250,000 salary, uh, a three-year deal to play in the league. Um, the plays are supposed to come faster, so there's less time for people to stand around doing nothing. I think it's only like a 10 or 15 second difference that the ball has to be snapped and in motion. And the way they're able to accomplish going faster is because of the, the head coach's headset is wired to the, to the uh, quarterback's helmet for each play design. So they, they send it through a microphone. But outside of that, there are no short field goal kicks after every six-point touchdown, no extra points. Um, every team has to go for two points with a small pass or run play. Um, if it fails, they stay with the six points. But if they succeed, they get eight in total. 
Uh, field goals from a longer distance still earn three points on the scoreboard. Uh, let's see. The biggest thing is that there aren't any kickoffs to start the game or every possession after the ball changes hands. So like the, the ceremonial first pitch in baseball, they have the ceremonial ball placement, which is kind of dumb. The guy just walks out and places it on the 25-yard uh, the line. So that's where everybody on offense starts, and they have to go at least 75 yards to score. Uh, so that's a rule change to keep players safe from running into each other as they fly down the field. And then there's another rule. Uh, which I, I don't entirely get, that says only five defenders are allowed to try tackling the quarterback for a loss at any given time. Uh, coaches can't call a traditional blitz where seven or eight guys are trying to run past the big five linemen in front for a sack. The sacks still happen, though, sometimes, because you have to remember, like, not every player is that professional, especially from what it seems to be the, uh, the lineman standpoint. And I'll get back to that level of skill in a second, but... Lastly, the commercials are quicker, uh, only 30 seconds on average. So most times they just run the ad off to the side of the screen, but keep a camera running on like the left side uh, to show the benches in the field. And I think the change of pace helps a lot because we know how slow and plagued an NFL game can get with commercials. Um, but yeah, the, the AAF seems promising enough that CBS aired the inaugural games for the Saturday opening night. And the estimates were about 2.1 million tuned in to see it. It was more than a primetime NBA game, for one thing. And the viewer count might not last, considering the excitement's probably going to die down after a while. And, and really, from what I saw, there isn't a lot of show-stopping talent um, out there on display to catch. And I saw what were the, the two lowest-scoring games last weekend. It was kind of clumsy college football, uh, where the quarterbacks aren't the most accurate. Uh, but at least the defense works hard, and they seem to have the most fun. Um, I'm going to keep talking about the AAF in just a little bit, but we have a weather check to conduct because it's about quarter past uh, the hour. So back to um, the Alliance of American Football. Uh, by far, uh, the biggest thing, uh, that the biggest story is like the amount of technology in place to give the viewer access to everything. So on the broadcast, you can hear the coach talking to the quarterback, the quarterback talking to his teammates, um, the, the breath from the quarterback as he look at, looks like left to right to, to figure out where to throw it. And there's apparently computer chips in every player's shoulder pads. And, and how they stay in one piece when guys are colliding with each other, I'll never know. But uh, they track the motion of everybody during a play. And they even have an official smartphone app where you can watch from a vantage point up high all these player numbers sliding around. Um, and you can sort of like predict the next play if it will be like a pass or a run. And so there's a game inside the game about being the best guesser. Um, apparently it happens so fast and reliably that the play on the smartphone sometimes happens before it takes place on the TV screen. Um, the broadcast delay is just slower than the time it takes for um, the computer graphics to process what's happening on the field and, and bring it up on the screen. Um, because it's like a GPS basically on every player. Uh, the football as well. I mean, the, the most confusing thing that happened during the Sunday evening game uh, between the Memphis Express and the Birmingham Iron was that a running back scored a touchdown, got excited, and spiked the ball on the ground. It flew into the stands, um, but he got his team flagged for a 15-yard penalty uh, because the league actually wants to keep the ball on the field. They've got a chip inside them too, and if a fan gets tossed one from a happy player, well, that's probably a lot of money being lost. I'd say about $100 or so. Um, but the player quality, though, I, I honestly believe is going to be the biggest drawback about the entertainment factor for this league. Because you need to look nowhere else uh, for the definition of a washed-up career than the former Penn State quarterback, Christian Hackenberg. Now, this guy was drafted into the NFL um, the second semester of my freshman year. And so far, he's been cut from four teams, um, the New York Jets and the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, to name just two of them. But they gave him a chance in the AAF, uh, named him the starter for the Memphis Express at quarterback. Um, I tuned in Sunday afternoon, and it was, it was just awful because <laughs> the Express scored a, a grand total of zero points the entire game. Uh, Hackenberg completed only 10 of his 23 passes, got sacked a few, and uh, got intercepted. 
as well. And and of course, because he's mic'd up and the field is recording his every sound, like some of the passes he threw over the heads of receivers or at their feet, he just swore loud on television, I think like two or three separate times. And the broadcast couldn't like censor it fast enough sometimes. And and they just called it like the heated nature of the game, but but yeah, I don't know how a guy is supposed to revive his career when he's struggling in the developmental league. Um, I wish him the best and all, uh, but but some things just don't work out. Uh, maybe I'll make mention sometime if his team does all right, but right now they're they're 0-1. But uh, that about wraps up my take on the Alliance of American Football, though. Um, and it's time to get back to the music. So how about some American football? That's the name of the band that's coming up, actually. Um, their, their group's first album was titled American Football as well and uh, came out in September 1999. Uh, here is the opener from that CD called Never Meant. I'll be back in about t- er, four minutes here on WVYC. Stay tuned. Welcome back to 88.1 FM WVYC, the voice of your college. That was American Football with Never Meant. And uh, but going into it, I almost said it would be 10 minutes long, which would be kind of crazy because it's kind of repetition, like um, repetitive. But uh, that's sort of the genre of what math rock is, I guess. It's a form of like progressive music. But uh, anyway, let's go into a technology story uh, in this segment, starting with a recent feud between Apple and Facebook about a certain research program that was sponsored by the latter. Uh, now, Facebook's been in trouble with just about everybody regarding the Cambridge Analytica scandal which basically came down to them being aware that a data company was reaching out to a small sum of Facebook users. And upon being given the okay by these individuals, the algorithms of this company proceeded to like scan through all the online activity of each volunteer, going through the social media feeds, um, stuff like that. I mean, and every friend of those participants as well. So like essentially creating this network of details that uh, Cambridge Analytica could use to lump people into certain groups based upon what they say and look at. Uh, Pretty much the political undertones of having a person's activity boiled down to our data thinks you're this party and and then perhaps being fed information, advertisements to either confirm or lead them astray as far as like reading news goes. But it was pretty powerful manipulation, but it wasn't exactly Facebook's fault. It was more like their obliviousness, I think. But this recent thing about Facebook research is a whole different story about the lengths that this company is going to to find out what its users are doing in their daily lives. So the website TechCrunch broke this story down like this. Uh, Facebook bought this data company called Onovo in 2014 for $120 million. Uh, Onovo is what's called a VPN that someone can install on their smartphone as an app. And I think it was basically just supposed to help people monitor their data as it was being sent and received on their mobile phone. So like the number of bytes of information and what other apps were using what, it, it helps if you're like like buying a data plan for your phone. When Facebook acquired Onovo, um, they could basically control this app and open it up and see, ooh, this person is using the Weather Channel and their local newspapers app and so on. But in June 2018, Apple rewrote some of the guidelines for apps that can appear on iPhones. That basically, uh, something like Onovo wasn't allowed to monitor the data that other apps were using anymore. So by August, basically the word Onovo had to disappear from Facebook's vocabulary, at least if it wanted to stick around like Apple's products. But then we get into Project Atlas which is basically a fancier name for this Facebook research thing that they wanted to promote to continue analyzing users. Facebook paired up with uh, these three other groups. Their names are Betabound, Utest, and Applause to basically show up on apps used by teens like uh, Instagram and Snapchat and place pop-up ads saying, hey, if you'd like to be paid $20 a month, check this out. And these three websites basically hid their association with Facebook, but still ask you to install the Facebook research app. But before you do that, there's fine print at least that says, by installing this, you're giving us permission to collect data from your phone that will help us understand how you browse the internet, what apps you have on your phone, and when you use them. And that's basically a direct quote. And if it sounds kind of sketchy, it, it's that's basically like, like what Onovo was doing. 
And TechCrunch in its report said, yeah, we looked at what was inside Facebook research. And it's got the same programming and code and details from back when it was called Onovo. And Facebook essentially got other sites to distribute their spying software. And the craziest thing about like how predatory this practice was, it's just that these three websites went out and said in their guidelines, We'd like 13 to 35 year olds to sign up for this. You can get $20 a month in the form of online gift cards, and you get another $20 when you refer a friend. Now there's no numbers out there to really say how many people theoretically fell for this, how many participants there were, but there had to be some folks that just read past the fine print and thought the money sounds nice. And it's silly because the fine print specifically said, we're gonna be tracking our every move, including how much data you're sending on our rival apps. And now that Facebook's been caught, Apple has told them to stop distributing this Facebook research app. Um, In their defense, Facebook said that this study was completely optional and people could stop it at any time. And a spokesperson actually claims that 5% of the people who chose to participate in this program were teenagers and all of them had signed parental consent forms. So yes, I mean, in the end, it makes me uncomfortable with the fact that Facebook still has the ambition to know every aspect of how we use our smartphones. But I feel some of the blame should fall on the participants themselves. Like, you basically sign your privacy away to wave a data company as big as Facebook into your phone and tell it it's okay to watch everything else that's passing through your phone. Because honestly, they could see every bit of data coming in and out. Like, they could know when you sent a text, um, when you sent a photo, um, like check the weather, read the news. I mean, they could find out every source. And and maybe it's not as worse as Cambridge Analytica, like looking at the words of someone's Facebook posts and going, hmm, this person sounds like a Republican or like a Democrat. This, this whole recent thing isn't trying to actively profile people, but I've got to wonder what exactly Facebook needs it all for. But since the fine print doesn't say the reasons need to be shared publicly, it's basically theirs to keep. Um, The funny thing is, the Facebook research app is still, I think, being distributed on Android phones because they're completely different than iPhones, different app store. Uh, But in the coming days, we might hear that side of the equation changes. Uh, But right now, like how uh, Mark Zuckerberg testified earlier in the past before the government, just last week, a a trio of senators sent emails to the CEO uh, curious about what was going on with Facebook research. I just wonder if, like, social media could start to have regulations stuck onto it, like every major company or industry for the safety of Americans. And it would make sense if you, like, consider the fact that there's some people out there that the social media sites know more about than the government themselves. Uh, Just kind of crazy to think about. But that's all the material I've got regarding this recent predicament for Facebook. It's about 3.31 here at York College of Pennsylvania, so I think now is a good time to announce the station's PSA for the hour. We'll move on and get back to the music now. This next one's all the way back from 1989 with some of the greats from jazz and rhythm and blues. I think this one's entirely performed by human voices. It's pretty impressive when I first heard it like so many years ago. Quincy Jones from the album Back on the Block. This is We Be Doing It. Take a listen, and I'll be right back on WVYC. Welcome back to 88.1 FM, WVYC, the voice of your college. That was Quincy Jones with We Be Doing It. And uh, next is a pair of quick stories to uh, continue our afternoon here on In the Studio. So NASA has said goodbye and closed the doors on one of their most incredible projects to date, I think. Uh, The Mars rover named Opportunity. So National Geographic magazine wrote this article about uh, this spacecraft that uh, landed on the planet January 25th, 2004, over 14 years ago. And finally, the agency announced its mission was complete. Uh, It broke, basically. (laughs) They think they lost the rover. Um, But it had some impressive mileage to it. So um, Opportunity had a sibling rover called Spirit, and that landed on January 4th, 2004, uh, got stuck in 2009, and then NASA lost contact with it during 2010. So Opportunity arrived around the same time, but it was driving slowly all the way up until June 2018 when the scientists back on Earth realized they couldn't really like make contact with it anymore. But uh, Opportunity went 
28 miles in distance when they only designed it to go less than one mile. Um, it survived 50 times longer than it was supposed to, uh, only about 90 Martian days back then. And uh, how did it last so long? Apparently, the, the answer to that was every November to January, they found out. There were supposedly winds strong enough to clean off the, the red dust on the rover's solar panels. So it could just get a slow recharge and keep pressing on. And it was last summer when apparently the strongest dust storm ever observed on Mars knocked out opportunity for a little bit. And um, now that the November to January windy season has come and gone, uh, NASA tried one last time to make contact and switch on the power, but basically the conclusion is it's done. It's uh, basically NASA's son or daughter, all grown up though now, and it lasted from preschool all the way up through 12th grade and beyond. But there's apparently some scientists working on the team um, who were working on it. Like, they were in, still in high school when Opportunity first touched down in 2004. I think it's a pretty surreal achievement that they got this far. And this rover is actually the one that found evidence of water that had to have been on Mars some billions and billions of years ago. They found minerals and clay inside of rocks that basically proved Mars had a very different climate once. In the end, it's got to be sort of heartbreaking for a, for a small set of people to have operated this rover for over a decade, and, and now they have to symbolically lay it to rest when, it, when it's just out there, like millions of miles away. It's just like a little scooter-sized dot on an entire planet. And just like it's all in its lonesome now, and who knows if it'll ever be found. Uh, some of the scientists for Spirit and Opportunity are working on the Mars 2020 rover, though, um, which aims to, to search for past life and pick up rocks and actually eventually launch them back to Earth for a study. Now, there's a few suggestions, I think this is neat, for the first human mission to Mars, um, that the people land at the Opportunity landing site, which would be like totally symbolic, really monumental, and hopefully we see that in our lifetime. And uh, as part of that article... I found out there's a, a really neat brand of scientists out there called analog astronauts who are independently simulating what life on Mars would be. Uh, so these are individuals from Austria, a, a small private group called the Austrian Space Forum. And though as a country they haven't really got any spacecraft up in orbit, but they've been doing missions for a few years uh, to a, a, a remote desert in the country of Oman where they uh, drop off a team of like half a dozen people and simulate what it would be like to search for life on Mars uh, for about a month at a time. It's got all the mental and physical challenges of being on, a, on another planet as well. Uh, it takes a 10 minute delay for the signal from the Oman desert to reach the Austrian mission control, just to kind of like pretend it's going from Mars to Earth. They wear three layered 100 pound spacesuits, like, which you can't even like wipe off the sweat you produce inside of them. And it takes three hours to get these suits on, one hour to get them off. And what these analog astronauts learn about pretending to be on Mars, NASA and like the Russian space program occasionally pay attention to what's going on during these trips for, for God knows what reason. But, but hey, apparently the first person to walk on Mars has already been born. But uh, the Austrian Space Forum hopes to send a six-person squad to the desert in Israel around 2020 to try more tests in the meantime. I just think it's a really interesting endeavor finding out like what life outside of Earth is and, and what it could be like while still on Earth. Anyway, it's about 3.40 here at your College of Pennsylvania. Time now for another music break. Vertical Horizon released this next track in November of 1999. Topped the Billboard charts in 2000. This one's called Everything You Want. You're listening to 88.1. FM WVYC, and I'll be back in a few minutes to continue the hour. Stay tuned. Welcome back to 88.1 FM WVYC, the voice of your college. That was Vertical Horizon with everything you want. Now, before I discuss some more news, let's get our second weather check of the hour done now that we're approaching the final 15 minutes of the show. Uh, last up on the list of major topics is a revisit to the current dilemma in American government. Is the wall going to be built? Uh, could Congress pass a budget bill safely that would circumvent another shutdown? Um, at this point today, the answer is yes, but with a little asterisk on it, it seems. Um, so 
Within the past few days, there were bipartisan negotiators cranking out this spending bill. I think it was 30, $333 billion or so that would fund all the important agencies, but it included a compromise of $1.3 billion for the barrier, a partial section of it. Only 55 miles of it or so. That is really, really expensive. <laughs> like, apparently there's terms in there that, for instance, say that these portions can only be built on only the most necessary locations. The protected sanctuaries and the historical sites have to be preserved. Uh, so there will at least be some discussion with local officials down at the southern border before, boom, construction goes up. But, like, how do you really read an 1,100-page report about spending that quickly? Uh, nobody in our government, like, either the people we trust or don't actually seem to, to pour over it. But yeah, just a, just a few hours ago, Trump spoke before reporters that he was going to use this little tactic he had in his back pocket and was playing around thinking of using it to get his wall. That's declaring a national emergency. Uh, it's now his new course of action to get this project rolling, and I think it's going to be something that gets contested, though, throughout the entirety of his term now. Uh, because what bugs me the most is that his whole strategy behind this is, well, I can't depend on a Democratic majority Congress anymore, and now it's time to use the furthest reaches of presidential power, basically. Maybe this is just geographically, like, how much, like, I'm isolated, I personally am from the southern border, but I don't see this situation as some kind of crisis. I see it as a national issue that needs to be discussed for the welfare of our nation, but it's centralized somewhere else, basically. This doesn't seem to be a so-called emergency that the that the entirety of the country needs to be mobilized. This issue has, like, unfortunately been going on for years and years now. And I get that drug trafficking, human trafficking, gang violence are all things that should be addressed, but smarter ways of handling it other than a physical barrier? I mean, we're just going back to the old days with the Great Wall of China, essentially. If it were possible, I guess, but investment in technology that can detect when individuals enter the country illegally, like shoring up those defenses instead would just be a part of a smart solution so nobody slips through undetained or something. I'm just still trying to see the significance of a project of this size when there's more to this issue than just, we have to just hope we can keep these people out, basically. But raising this to a national emergency level, I'm mostly concerned with like how loosely that can be interpreted. Like the whole going around Congress thing that, to me, sets a bad precedent for future administrations. I'd even be skeptical if, like, a Democratic president in the future came around and said, you know what we need? Um, r roller skates for everyone or something. Like, because vehicle emissions are bad and climate change is an emergency, so we must get around another way. I mean, the, the future comparisons to a crisis like this just sound too vague. And it appears to me that, like, Trump just wants progress, as many victories for his base as he can in a short time. The border wall is just one of them. But you can't go around the branch of government that's basically supposed to be choosing how our agencies get funded and the allotment of resources and deciding all that. Because it goes against the wishes of the Congress that we just elected in and are supposed to be representing us. I mean, that's basically the whole ordeal here. But we'll see how this whole debate turns out, but this is only just the start of the wall dilemma, I think. But uh, but yeah, to change gears here to something else, though, really quick, isn't it kind of a shame that the White House doesn't have a dog? Like, he's the first president in a century, like 120 years, ever since President McKinley to not have a dog at some point in the Oval Office. I know it's kind of a strange thing to bring up, but my art teacher yesterday brought in her 9-year-old beagle uh, to class, and it just brightened the room a bit. Uh, maybe distracted us from doing painting, but it's it's really an emotional boost uh, just about everywhere to have an animal around. But, uh, I mean, unless that is you're allergic, which is unfortunate. But, yeah, the, the lack of a dog is just another one of the unconventional things that Trump is doing in office. Anyway, it's about nine minutes into the close of the hour here on In the Studio. There is one more song to play and a reflection about Valentine's Day yesterday that I'd like to throw in. So, keep it here, and... Uh, Let's knock out one of those last songs with uh, this track made in October 1999 by the Norwegian pop duo M2M. This is from their album Shades of Purple, and it's called Don't Say You Love Me. I'll be back in a few minutes here on WVYC. 
right, welcome back to 88.1 FM WVYC, the voice of your college. M2M with Don't Say You Love Me off their debut album Shades of Purple way back in 1999. And that final track story is actually kind of interesting because it was released in the soundtrack to the first Pokemon movie um, in 1999 before M2M even released that debut album. And Pokemon as a franchise now has like 18 movies apparently. It's It's been forever since I last saw anything TV or film related from that series though. But finally this afternoon I wanted to remark on the missing tradition of Valentine's Day this year. Now something that you might have already heard about. There weren't any new shipments of those candy hearts. The, the little boxes of those sweethearts from the Neko company. The little hard candies that you couldn't really see the messages printed on them even today because they get all smudged. But this is like the first time since 1886 these boxes haven't been on store shelves apparently. And the same goes for the Neko wafers, the, the hard disks that they even sent with World War II fighters because they just last and last in their packaging. And yeah, I've heard some people say like good riddance to them because they taste like flavored chalk. I didn't particularly like the chocolate ones, but some of those wafers were just kind of odd tasting. But sweethearts were always good. Uh, the best thing to share on Valentine's Day in elementary school as a kid. And I just looked this up a few hours ago. But uh, apparently the uh, Brax Candy Company still has their variety of conversation hearts available. I saw a three pound bag of these things listed for the patriotic price of $17.76 for three pounds of these things. I, I thought it was just crazy. I know I don't love them that much. But anyway, that'll about do it for this edition of the show. If you missed anything in the past, don't forget that you can go online to YouTube.com and search In the Studio with Keel and Tollinger and look up the past weeks, where you don't even have to listen to the music or the weather and announcement breaks. But thank you once again for joining me, and I'll see you back here next week. Once again, my name is Keel and Tollinger, and appreciate you tuning into WVYC. We will leave things off here with uh, George Harrison and the song My Sweet Lord here on 88.1 FM. Take care and have a great weekend, everybody.